are going to be taking notes on section 3.2. We're going to talk about using the lead coefficient to determine end behavior. Um, so first thing we're going to do is let's do, we'll just talk about an example. I think it'll be cl pretty clear after we do a few examples. When you're trying to determine end behavior, what you want to know is if I were to look at the graph of this, what would be happening on the ends of each side? What, where would my arrowheads be? Are my arrowheads going to be going one down and one up? They're both going to be up? Or might they both be down? So when you're asked about end behavior, that's what you're looking for. How are these going to go? What are they going to look like? So if we're looking at this particular function to determine end behavior, the first thing I want to identify is the highest degree. In this case, it's a 3. If it's odd, so if the degree is odd, then your end behavior is one up, one down. Or one rises, one falls. And now we just have to be able to determine, well, which way is it? Is it the left rising and the right falling or vice versa? Well, in that case, I would just keep in mind this function, which you know very well, the linear parent function. And it always looks like this. The linear parent function is falling left, rising right. And that is our example for anything with an odd exponent. If it looks like this, that's the negative version of the linear parent function, y equals negative x, and it would look like this. Falling right, rising left. Because it's going up to the left and down to the right. So I can do any odd polynomial the same way. So if I were to have y equals x to the fifth, etc, 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 this is positive. So it's going to behave just like my positive linear parent function. It's going to rise right, fall left. If I were to have, for example, y equals negative x cubed, Etc. 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 This is going to behave just like my negative linear parent function, which means it is going to rise left, fall right. So that's always a good way to do these. So with that in mind, if the degree on my polynomial is even, we're going to compare it to this well-known function or quadratic, because it has an even exponent. And it always looks like this, rising left, rising right. So both are pointed up. If I were to do this and make it negative, it would be falling left and right. So anything with an even exponent can be compared the same way. So if I have y equals, let's say, 5x to the 4th plus 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus x minus 7. That looks like a big polynomial, but really the only thing I'm concerned about is this. It's positive and it's even, which means it's going to behave just like my positive quadratic. So I think back, it's going to look just like this one, because this one's positive and even. So that means my end behavior is doing this, rising right and rising left. If I were to have one that, let's say, negative 6x to the 12th plus 7x squared minus x plus 10. This one looks, I mean, strange because I have this exponent of 12, but all I'm concerned about is that it's negative and even which means it's going to behave just like the negative quadratic. 
So my end behavior is going to do this. It may do all manner of things in between, but the end behavior is falling left and falling right. And that's all you have to do when you identify end behavior. The next thing that we're going to do in this chapter is we are going to find zeros of a polynomial function. So if you remember back to Algebra 2 and Precalculus, you remember that zeros are the same things as x-intercepts. If we're lucky, we can plug a function into our calculator and identify the zeros. So if this is the function I've been given, my first go-to is going to be plug it into your calculator and see if you can see them. So I'm going to go to my calculator, to my y equals, and I'm going to plug in this function exactly as it's written. So x cubed plus 3x squared minus x minus 3. I'm going to hit graph, and if I look at it, it does look like I can see three zeros, and I should have three zeros because this is cubic, which means I should have three zeros, and I see three right there, so I'm going to go to my table just to check them. Remember, your zeros are where y is zero. So there's one at negative one, one at one, and look like the other one was at, yeah, negative three. So there's my three zeros. So my answer is x equals negative three, negative one, and one. Those are the three zeros that are in this polynomial. So like I said, if you're lucky, you'll be able to find those zeros in your calculator. Now later on in the chapter, we'll figure out what to do if we can't do that. So now what we're going to do is talk about multiplicities. Zeros can occur more than once. And if you remember, we did talk about that in Algebra 2 when we referred to double roots. Um, when we had quadratics that set right on the x-axis and they had a double root, it meant that that zero was really there two times, and you probably remember that. But now what we want to do is talk about their multiplicities. Multiplicity means how many times does the zero occur? And this is why it's important. If a zero has even multiplicity, For example, it appears two, four, six times. Then the graph touches the axis and turns. So if a zero has even multiplicity, for example, it appears two, four, six times. Then the graph touches the axis and turns. And when I say the axis, I mean the x-axis. So if it has odd multiplicity, it passes through the axis. Now, in order to determine multiplicity, your function has to be in factored form. It already has to be factored. But we're going to go ahead and look at one that has already been factored so it'll start to make more sense. So I'm going to be given a function f of x, and for example, this one is x plus 1 times 2x minus 3 squared. So I can identify that I have zeros here. There's a zero here at x equals negative 1. And there's a zero here at x equals 3 halves. The multiplicity is how many times each one of those occurs. Well, I determine that by the degree. And in this case, this only occurs one time because there's no exponent here. So that really has an exponent of 1. This zero has a multiplicity of 2, or it's what we would call a double root. It appears twice. So these are their multiplicities. Well, if you look back at what we just said, when, if I were to look at the graph of this, 
the graph would pass through the x-axis here and touch and turn here. So let's go ahead and plug this in our calculator and see exactly what that means. I'm going to plug it in just like this. You don't have to multiply it out. I'm just going to plug in x plus 1 and then 2x minus 3 squared. So I put, put that in my calculator and when I hit graph, you can see that at my first point, negative 1, that was that first 0 that had an odd multiplicity, it does in fact pass through. At 3 halves, which is 1 and a half, it had an even multiplicity, and you can see how it touches the graph and turns back around, or what we call bounces. Um, so that's what it happens with multiplicity. If it's got an even multiplicity, it touches the graph and turns. If it has an odd multiplicity, it passes through. So let's look at another one that's already in factored form. It's already in factored form. That makes it easy to identify the zeros. So I get x equals negative 1 half as one of my zeros, and x equals 5. I check my multiplicities to determine what happens at each zero. This multiplicity is even. So at negative 1 half, touches and turns. And at 5, it's got an odd multiplicity, so it passes through. So for right now, um, that's all of the notes that we will take on section 3.2.